All right, welcome to another episode of Nathan Builds Robots. Today's topic is going to be kit printers. Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace and I'll tell you a little more about them later. The reality of buying and building your own kit printer is much different than just the highlights reel of people having their fully assembled printers and doing all sorts of cool stuff with them. Instead of getting a fully assembled printer that works out of the box, you get a box of parts. You just have to figure out how to build it and put it together yourself and you know, that's supposed to be fun. In my experience, it isn't that fun. I actually really dislike building these printers. So today I'm gonna to complain about that, but I also wanna provide some feedback to these projects on how they can improve their designs and make it a little bit easier for people to get involved with them. Now the fundamental problem with a lot of these kit printer projects is the incentive structure. I've heard someone say that, show me the incentive structure and I'll show you the outcome. Basically, when you're outsourcing part of the manufacturing process, in the case of these kit printers, it's the final assembly, then you kind of lose the traditional engineering and manufacturing feedback loop that exists, where if you make a bad design and you have to build it yourself, then you're wasting a ton of time and that's cutting into your profit margins. So you have to throw it back to engineering and make design improvements so that it's easier to manufacture, so you can build them faster, sell more of them, and make more money. With kit printers, because they're just ordering a bunch of parts on wholesale websites like Alibaba or AliExpress, they break that circle of engineering development. And instead what we have is a situation where they produce a design, they kick it out the door, and then they leave the users to struggle with the actual assembly process. Now some projects handle this better than others. Probably the best example of a kit printer that's easy to build and works relatively well as a final product is the Prusa line of printers, so the Prusa MK4. The reason for that is that the Prusa company builds and tests their own products. They also have quite a bit of their product diverted into their own production line where it does make sense for them to spend a lot of extra engineering time to make the things more manufacturable. Just some quick examples on this printer. A lot of the fasteners are hidden behind other parts. So let's say I need to remove one part of this machine because it was printed wrong or it cracked or something. I end up having to disassemble the entire half of the machine. Another issue that I have with a lot of these kit printers, which is particularly bad on the Voron side of things, they've got too many design variations and hot end variations and extruder variations. If you go to the official website and try and figure out what parts you need to print, it gets incredibly complicated because there isn't just one standard build that you're doing. Everybody wants to throw on their own version of a main board or random upgrades that are scattered throughout the build. What they need to do is they need to rule with an iron fist a little bit and just decide, hey, this is one version of the printer and if you want to build a Voron, this is the configuration that you have to get. You have to buy this hot end, this extruder, these fans, uh, this main board, and then put it together. The other issue that I have with kit printers is their overuse of 3D printed parts. Let's take a look at this printer for example. I like that the frame is entirely made out of metal, so this will be extremely durable and rigid. However, the Voron project I think is going a little overboard with 3D printing a bunch of components. It's not a great look when you have parts that are 3D printed and you have joints that aren't adequately reinforced such that if I were to move it and let's say I drop it a little bit, oh, whoa, you know, I would feel very uncomfortable doing that with the Voron printer that I've built because I, I'm pretty sure it's gonna knock some things out of alignment. However, on printers like this thing from Creality and this thing from Bamboo Lab, if I knock this around, the joints are strong enough that it's not going to permanently deform. Voron printers use these blind joints in the corners, which are really not that strong. It's plenty stiff for the purposes of running prints, but in terms of how much load it can take before it shifts, it's really not that good. That's generally why you want to use bolted joints with multiple bolts and metal parts. Putting in a design requirement of it has to be able to survive a uh, like a drop from a foot high. Because that kind of stuff happens in the real world, especially if you're moving your printers around a lot. You might accidentally slip it out of your hands or you put it in your car and it falls over or something. You don't want the printer to become unfunctional because of that. One of the things that I really dislike about these enthusiast kit printers is they're really difficult to get started with and build. And it used to be the same way when you were building a website. But fortunately, thanks to today's sponsor, Squarespace, 
that process has become a lot more streamlined. Squarespace helps take the guesswork out of building a website. So all you have to do is go to squarespace.com and you can go ahead and get started. Using their professionally designed templates or their new Blueprint AI system means that you can get a website put together that looks really good and professional in less time than it takes to build an Ender 3. So if you want to get started and build your own website using Squarespace, make sure to go to squarespace.com to get a free trial started. And if you like your website and you want to launch it, go to squarespace.com slash NathanBuildsRobots to get 10% off your first domain or website purchase. Thanks for sponsoring this episode, Squarespace. Now let's get back to printing. In college, I took a class on aircraft design. And when looking at how to design landing gear, it's so simple to actually understand what you need to do to design something to be relatively indestructible. Basically, you need the system to be able to absorb all of the energy of the impact. If you've done that, then you can have the thing drop infinite number of times and it's gonna be fine. If you make the joints strong enough so that when it gets to those high loads, the actual members of the frame bend without having anything slip, then, um, then that's gonna survive impact. So yeah, I think using 3D printed parts in areas where they see high loading, if you were to drop the, the printer, I think that's generally not a good idea. 3D printed parts make a lot of sense for components that have a lot of complexity in them. But even still, if you're producing more than 100 of something, it probably makes sense to get an injection mold made yeah, I think if they just shipped these printers out with a bunch of injection molded parts that allowed you to put the printer together yourself easily, you know, that might make sense. If you look at printers like, you know, from Creality and Bamboo Lab, do they use any 3D printed parts? No. You know why they don't use 3D printed parts? Because they kind of suck. Nobody wants 3D printed parts when you could have a more affordable process make them instead. That's why you don't see 3D printed products in everyday life because you can get cheaper and higher performing parts using other manufacturing methods. And especially when it comes to 3D printers, what's the goal of a 3D printer when you design a 3D printer? You want it to be as stiff and as strong as possible and also as reliable as possible. With 3D printed parts, they're generally kind of unreliable because of all the process variation. On this printer, the LH Stinger, a lot of the parts that I printed out myself, I used some ABS that required a higher temperature chamber than this Creality K1C could manage. So the layer adhesion isn't great. I've got a bunch of brittle parts on here that I'm worried about failing. And given how long it takes to print those parts and how long it takes to disassemble and reassemble this printer, I'm having a hard time deciding, you know what, I'm gonna invest another 20 to 40 hours into this project getting this working. I can't afford to be spending all my time on this one printer when I'm the definitive source of 3D printing news and I have to be looking at other printers. All right, so the other issue I have with 3D printer kits is they're not very high value. Things like the Voron, you're getting a Core XY printer that doesn't have as good of speeds or accelerations as what you can get from Creality or Bamboo Lab. On top of that, the kits end up costing more than the printers from Creality or Bamboo Lab. One project that I think is doing a great job in terms of having a good value proposition is the Rook printer series by Rolahan. Those are very low cost machines. They're using simple components, uh, relatively few printed parts. So if you wanted a lower cost kit printer, I'd definitely be checking that project out. And really what it comes down to there is like putting your design project on a diet, being like, hey, I can only spend this amount of money and I want the kits to cost this much. So what are the compromises that I need to make in the design to get the cost down to a point where it's like economically viable and more affordable for more people. So yeah, using less components, using lower cost components, these are all things that you can do to help keep the cost down. Another thing that I think the Rook series is doing quite well is keeping the design simple and easy to build. So yeah, for me personally, I don't quite get the appeal of uh, a kit printer. I don't know if I wanna use the term wasted, but I've spent a lot of time putting those printers together over the last two months and I feel like my video output has gone down. And I feel like the best kit printers to ever exist were the original Ender 3s, where it took you maybe two or three hours to put together. And at the end of it, you had a pretty good printer. It wasn't the fastest thing in the world. It didn't have the greatest build quality, but it produced high quality prints and was relatively cheap and easy to put together. 
and we don't really have options for low-cost kit printers anymore. And I do think it's important for people to still be able to build their own printers. You know what, maybe that's a motivation of why it might be a good reason to start with the old Ender 3 instead of this new stuff from Creality and Bamboo Lab that's like pretty much pre-assembled and ready to go out of the box. Because in the process of putting something together, you're learning a lot of skills with electronics, soldering, different types of connectors that are common, linear motion components, motors, how all that gets wired up and put together. You learn how to be able to do troubleshooting. So you're getting a lot more out of the printer other than just having an appliance. You have to be a hardcore hobbyist who already has multiple printers and understands how all this stuff works to get started with a Voron. Whereas the Creality and the Prusa products were really more designed for someone with no experience in electronics. Really, it's more about learning than actually having a 3D printer. So yeah, that's my rant on kit printers. I feel like too many of them are going too far into the extreme hobbyist area and they're kind of losing the casual hobbyists. I feel like people who get into 3D printing nowadays aren't gonna have that same experience. They're not gonna really understand how the 3D printer works at a component level. With these Bamboo Lab printers, they're basically actively hostile towards people disassembling the printer themselves. Creality is trying to chase the Bamboo Lab product model as much as possible, and now their new products don't require much assembly. And they're not really doing a whole lot with their older product line. So we're gonna end up in an era where people don't build kit printers, they just buy printers and use them like an appliance. So I do think there's an unmet need for a 3D printer that's low cost and will teach people about the basics of 3D printer design. So I don't see a whole lot of kit printers in my future. I'll finish up my Voron and I'll do some upgrades to it. Well, thanks for watching this episode of Nathan Builds Robots. If you like this episode, give me a subscribe. Let me know about your favorite kit printers and what you think they do, good or bad, in the comments below. And I'll see you in the next episode.